Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Team Inc. and its continuation of its housing forum as we navigate into the first half of 2023. My name is David Morgan and I work at Team and we're really excited uh, to bring to you tonight um, two expert panelists um, speaking to the work of affordable housing plans, um, including affordable housing committees, as well as some uh, a, a deeper dive into zoning. Um, and uh, we also want to share a little bit with you about the growing empathy movement throughout Team Inc.'s region, and that is the all-in movement. And I'm going to share with you a couple of slides before we introduce um, our two expert panelists. And we also have a number of our leaders um, of the growing all-in movement on the screen here who are joining us tonight. They get it pretty easy tonight. Um, our all-in leaders from Milford, up to Seymour, Ansonia, Derby, Oxford, Shelton. Uh, due to some scheduling challenges, we don't have a rep from Shelton tonight. Um, and we also have one of our integral partners, NVP and Jackie, um, who are here to um, uh, put a face and name to the contact info. If you are uh, living in one of Teams communities or deeply committed um, to being a part of the solutions um, in, in uh, working with Team, on our two major uh, uh, areas. And that is number one, increasing the supply of affordable housing, as well as increasing uh, sensitivity and understanding to the issue of affordable housing. And what we mean when we say affordable housing, we like to call it workforce opportunity housing, but you're gonna hear more about that. And so tonight is um, our first workshop and you can see uh, um, our town has an affordable housing plan. Now, what do we do? Um, and how we connect policy prescriptions and solutions um, throughout Team Inc's region, as well as our commitment to the all-in movement and this alliance of communities building long-term trust and relationships and relational infrastructure so we can move the needle on some of these very um, deep issues around having a, a safe, decent place to live, a place where food is secure, and above all, the most strong, most common denominator, and that is um, uh, the decisions, um, uh, meaningful involvement in the decisions that affect our lives. Um, again, many of you know team just in the last year alone, we've helped more than 15,000 individuals from all walks of life. Um, and on behalf of our board of directors and our staff, we're over 170 team professionals strong. We welcome you to this workshop. We hope to increase some knowledge and understanding on some of the complexities of increasing um, access um, to the full array of housing options. And we have so many programs here at Team Inc. We're going to dive a little into housing assistance. And again, just over the in the last year alone, we unveiled this at our recent annual convening of Team Inc., where we saw an 81% increase in the number of people um, who are turning to Team seeking assistance with housing. Um, and again, Team does a lot of work specific to evic eviction assistance and arrearages, security deposit, budgeting and planning, tenant and landlord communication and mediation, and of course, holistic approaches to helping people, um, pro providing a pathway to self-sufficiency through um, case management referral and linkages. Um, one example of one of our uh, COVID-19 response and recovery, and we are in recovery phase um, through the uh, uh, one of our funding sources, ARPA, American Rescue Plan, um, funding that started um, in just this past August, 94% of the funds, um, which are used to address social, economic, environmental recovery due to the devastating impacts of COVID-19 on individuals socially, economically, environmentally, 94% of that funds in that one example has gone towards um, housing costs. Um, another example, we've seen a, a over 36% increase compared to this time a year ago of, of individuals turning to Team Inc. for housing, excuse me, for heating and utilities assistance. And then one of the things, you know, that we really want to emphasize here when we talk about, number one, we need to increase the supply of affordable housing. Every community has a responsibility to house all of its workers, all of its people. Um, and number two, we need to increase sensitivity and understanding to the issue when we say, quote unquote, affordable housing. Um, when you look at the latest data at the fair market rate right here in Connecticut for a modest two bedroom apartment listed at just over $1,400 a month, 
um, an individual would have to be making um, just under $28 an hour at full time, 40 hours a week. Um, if a single bedroom apartment fair market rate right here in Connecticut um, for a one bedroom, um, about $22.52 an hour. Um, so when we're talking about affordable housing, we're talking about um, workforce opportunity housing, this is everybody. This is this is the collective us. This is our emergency first responders, our paralegals, child care workers, entry level health care workers, um, hospitality, retail workers, manufacturers, um, social services and human services providers, mental health counselors, dental assistants, and so on and so on. Um, you can go to our team website tonight is to give you a deep dive and a tasting, if you will, around affordable housing plans and committees and some connections to local zoning within the town that you live in or you're deeply committed to. Um, we will be we are recording this and we will archive it on our dedicated page of our team website. And we really want to give a shout out to so many partners that team looks up to. Um, one I absolutely want to underscore is the Nogtuck Valley Council of Governments did their Envision conference this past fall, where they really amplified affordable housing as a, as a critical pillar. You know, this state of Connecticut, Teams region included, will sink without a housing fix. We have to address affordable housing. And uh, their conference not only looked at transportation, economic development and opportunity, public involvement, but also did a focus 75 minute piece on affordable housing. So we highly recommend um, you you tune into it, um, and again, you can listen to it on audio, um, and, and it covers the full array of housing options, and that's on our dedicated page. There are no shortage of articles and headliners throughout Teams region um, around housing affordability. Um, the lack that you know the state of Connecticut is well over 85,000 units short of rental housing. Um, we have a significant people shortage. Um, and we lead the country as far as the lowest uh, vacancy rate in, in the nation with uh, a rental units, affordable housing rental units. Um, also want to um, highlight our growing all in movement. And again, these articles go on and on. We have even a recent one in Seymour, that one of our leaders who is going to briefly be speaking tonight from all in for Seymour. And I'm just going to show you to protect your time and the time of our panelists this growing movement of building relational infrastructure from residents and neighbors, uh, P&Z commissioners, mayors, state legislators. Here is an image you're going to hear from Jenny Rice momentarily, one of our more than 60 leaders. And Jenny is representative of All In for Seymour and uh, who opened up a, a little free pantry on Skokorat and Seymour right in the early phases of the pandemic. And you can see images of Jenny's little free pantry. Um, and examples of uh, community gatherings of all of, of elected officials from first select women, mayors, uh, and, and PNZ commissioners, residents, um, having deep dialogue and conversations um, from Milford to Oxford, Ansonia, Derby, Shelton, um, as well as our integral partners of NVP so, uh, on the ground, um, deeply committed to um, uh, housing um, and then some in, in Waterbury, Watertown and beyond. And again, pictures tell a thousand words, but you can see how we are working very hard to build relationships, build relational infrastructure and that intersection with policy where we own what we make. Um, no town, no city needs others, certainly not from Hartford or elsewhere to come in and provide prescriptions on housing and other um, developments. If we own what we make, we build within. So deep, so team is deeply committed to building that relational infrastructure through the all-in movement where individuals who live within their towns can actually have a seat at the table, um, meaningfully involved in the decisions that affect our lives. This is an example of all in France, Sonia Derby, meeting with the mayor of Derby, doing a downtown work of downtown Derby, looking at the future housing developments and opportunities where small business is expanding um, and having conversations around this immense social and economic responsibility to house all of our people and all of our workers. Um, I have the real honor to turn this over to one. Again, you have a number of all-in leaders on our panelist screen tonight supporting Jocelyn and John. Um, and I've asked Jenny Rice from All In for Seymour, who was recently recognized by the town of Seymour just this past fall by First Select Woman Dragonis, the board of select people for town of Seymour, 
recognizing Jenny's leadership with in addressing food insecurity, as well as leading the way within the All In for Seymour movement. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to turn off my screen and ask Jenny to share um, a few brief comments about her journey within the All In movement before we turn it over to Savannah Nicole. Jenny, please. Thank you, David, and thank you everybody for being here. I think if I could send everybody away with one thing, um, it would be the knowledge that I did not know what I was doing when I opened a pantry. Um, I knew what that flavor of heart felt like to be the kid who didn't have enough to eat. I knew what that shame and stigma felt like um, to be part of a family that didn't have enough and the societal implications of what that meant. And I knew um, the effects of nutrition on development because I worked as a healthcare provider and I knew that I didn't want that for other kids in my neighborhood. And that even families who qualify for services sometimes do not reach out because of that stigma. Um, I happen to live across the street from a school and the drop-off line gets backed up in traffic in front of my house. And I thought, what a wonderful opportunity if there were a box of food there um, to get those kids something to eat. And I had minimal experience in nonprofits. I didn't know a ton about stewarding a pantry. I didn't know how to build a pantry, but I had seen a news clip of the Little Free Pantry on Church in Ansonia. And I was like, well, we're going to do that. Um, and so I sort of fumbled my way through it in the beginning. And we went from having that little tiny pantry that was in the middle picture that David showed to that pantry now being a library. The original pantry um, got moved into a much larger pantry. We now have multiple community garden beds. We're tripling the size of our garden. And it's been a lot of learning along the way. Um, and so organizing has sort of been the same effort. It's been this magic of when you bring community to a really large scale problem, when you just bring a focus to it and say, hey, like we're aware of this, there's this problem, like putting my face to that problem and being like, hey, you know, I'm not gonna be ashamed of this. This is something that's going on in our community. Let's shine a light on it and let's come together to solve this problem together. And, and people just showed up in droves because it's not that people don't wanna help, it's that they often don't know how to show up. That's the main question that we get working with our community and listening to our community because it's it's fundamental to have this two-way dialogue um and so you know my advice to people is get involved in whatever you're passionate about right like everybody has a brand of hard everybody has a skill set that they're good at um you could start by going to town meetings you know towns work better when we engage with them um it was so easy compared to what i thought it would be in terms of, of having a dialogue and a relationship with our town government. Like we asked our town leadership for a meeting. They sat down and met with us. We told them what our goals were. We had open communication with them, not just with them, but with the community. We created the environments for stories to be heard and we invited them to come and listen. And they did. Um, we had lots and lots of questions when we went to meetings and they were happy to answer them. So I think you know, people can get caught up in this idea of perfection that you need to show up well to be able to accomplish anything. But I think it's exactly the opposite of that, right? Like you just need to care deeply and you need to be willing to show up. And if you are willing to do that and you do it with curiosity um, and you do it with a little bit of passion, like people are going to want to help you. They're going to want to help themselves. They're going to want to help their neighborhoods. And and you're going to learn a ton along the way, like just learning how interconnected everything is. People use my pantry because they can't afford their housing. If they could afford their rent, if they could afford their mortgage, if they could afford their living expenses, then they would have money for food. Um, but it's it's all interconnected. And the fact that they're struggling, the things that they're struggling with, our government is also struggling with, right? Our government is struggling with the cost of healthcare. Our government is struggling with the cost of utilities. Um, and those are things that get burdened on the taxpayers when we can't create the funds necessary to fill those shortfalls. So there's there's no being siloed in these situations. We all are being affected, whether we want to acknowledge it or not. 
Um, and we all have a responsibility when we have, have the time and the ability um, to show up as a community uh, and address our big problems. Because when we all come together, right, we can take on those big problems. We can have out of the box solutions. Um, and, and really it's those small people who have that imagination to see change who, who make change happen. Thank you so much, Jenny. You know, you're bringing me back to a fond recollection of one of the all in for Seymour community gatherings, more than 33 people coming together at Trinity and first select woman Dragonis and chief of staff stand and having a dialogue with residents, older adults, millennials and, and Gen Zers and having the conversation around the development, you know, the town of Seymour uh, did an extension where they needed more time to do their affordable housing plan. And to hear, to your point, elected officials stand before the audience and say, look, we're at 5.78%. We have some work to do. And here's what and we need your feedback on the draft of our plan. And then they put it up on social media and got a really nice feedback with all in for Seymour and many other residents of Seymour. Um, and then published a plan in December. Um, and part of that catalyst was, you know, your leadership and your work, Jenny, and many others from the all in movement. Later, um, Lily's going to share the contact info. Again, we will want to give you a face and name to some of our more than 60 leaders of the growing all in movement from Milford all the way up uh, throughout Teams region. Um, but again, we have Eric Asari here from All In Fransonia Derby, Jennifer Paradis, All In for Milford. Uh, we've got Jackie from NVP, Noctuck Valley Project. Um, myself and Lily at team, when in doubt, reach out to us if you're not sure who to connect with. Stephanie Ocasio, All In Fransonia Derby, Bob Van Agen, All In for Oxford, and of course, Jenny Rice, All In for Seymour. And so now we'd love to hand it over to Savannah Nicole Villalba, who has been an absolute angel on the wings of team as far as identifying and developing a speakers bureau of expert policy panelists um, and has brought um, this evening is going to talk about um, and do a background on John and Jocelyn. But um, we are really grateful that uh, Savannah Nicole is standing alongside Team Inc and helping us bring this rich information um, to Teams region so we can move that needle on affordable housing access as well as increasing sensitivity, education, understanding to the issue of workforce opportunity housing. Savannah Nicole, please. Thank you for such a kind introduction. All right, let me share my screen. And then also, Jenny, just thank you so much for your remarks. I think when we speak to our experiences, whether they're successes or challenges, it helps us connect and remember that we're not alone. And when we remember we're not alone, that's where we really are the most impactful when we come together. So just, it's not always easy to share. So just, I really appreciate that. So, and also thank you for everyone else who has taken time out of their lives to attend today. It's great to see so many people interested in continuing to engage with your community's affordable housing plan, which leads us to our topic. Our municipality has an affordable housing plan, now what? So we hope that by the end of tonight's session, you have a variety of next steps or action items that you can choose from to continue the work that you took on with your community as you made your affordable housing plans. So I affectionately call myself a bit of a geek. So for all of my kindred spirits out there who like to know the history of what I'm doing, why I'm doing it and, and how I got here, I'm gonna take a brief moment just to talk about um, the affordable housing plan requirement in Connecticut. So that requirement was established in 2017 and was codified in the Connecticut General Statute section 8-30J. So that's what you hear often when people are saying 8-30J or affordable housing plans, they're, they're talking about that requirement. During the 2021 legislative session, that's where we saw that June 1st, 2022 deadline take place. Some municipalities had finished their plans prior to that date, but I think that really lit a fire and a lot of communities throughout the, the state of Connecticut. And so currently, eight municipalities in Team Inc's region, the communities they serve, have affordable housing plans. Many of the leaders are on our screen that represent some of these communities, including Insonia, Bethany, Milford, Orange, Seymour, Shelton, Waterbury, and Woodbridge. And most, if not all, of the outstanding communities are currently working on their plans. 
and I know this from David telling me his his polite conversations and and gentle encouragement that him and Lily and team provide to to our friends that are still working on it. So if you're in one of those communities, we believe that this webinar will still be helpful to you. So again, since most of the communities and the purpose of today is what comes after the adoption of a plan, um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about the requirements of the plan. The purpose of the plan was to specify how your municipality intends to increase the number of affordable housing developments within your community. And there are a variety of resources that were created to assist in the affordable housing plan process. These include guidebooks that were created by the Department of Housing and the Regional Plan Association, Planning for Affordability in Connecticut, technical assistance from your councils of governments, whether that be the NVCOG or SCROG assisting in drafting and adopting affordable housing plans, uh, data sources that have come from a variety of nonprofit and governmental entities, such as Partnership for Strong Communities, the Census Bureau, or the State of Connecticut. So there has been a lot of information that has been available as, as you work on these plans. And so one thing that I always think is important when we're having these sort of policy conversations and, and just conversations in general about complex topics is that we define key terms that are gonna be used throughout tonight's conversation. We wanna all be on the same page when we're having a discussion and a way to ensure that we are is to ensure that when we say specific terminology that we you at least know where, where we're coming from. So to start, I'd like to go over housing affordability. On a national state and local level, housing affordability is often defined as housing in which households pay 30% or less of their income on housing costs. When a household spends more than 30% of their income on housing costs, they're considered cost burdened. And if a household spends more than 50% of their income on housing costs, they're considered severely cost burden. And again, I bet many of you have heard this, but I think the key part here is to hone in on, on why that matters. So if a household is cost burdened, they have less money and resources to pay for other households needs, such as food, to, to Jenny's point earlier, to transportation, to get to their jobs and back, the way that David talks about workforce housing, and healthcare, which is important for all of us to be able to engage meaningfully in our community. It also can impact a uh, household's ability to engage with their community at large, whether that be perspectives left out of community conversations or dinners like the all-in chapter hold, um, or less dollars locally spent on the businesses that your community loves and that makes your communities unique. So the final two terms I'd like to go over are affordable housing and naturally occurring affordable housing and the distinction between the two because I think that it's important. Both affordable housing and naturally occurring affordable housing are housing options that have housing affordability, so that, that first term as a component. However, only affordable housing maintains that protection through a subsidy or affordability restriction. While both are beneficial to a community, households who earn less are more likely to be impacted by market and supply forces that we all saw during the COVID-19 pandemic that raised housing costs significantly. And the slides that David provided earlier just highlighted the way that the pandemic and the supply and the market issues really were bringing people to team that they had not seen before um, on terms of housing issues. So for households in affordable housing units that are protected, they're protected from these changes in the market. Households who are in the naturally occurring units have no protection from those potential market changes as rents can rise from year to year, potentially making a unit that was once affordable no longer. So if most of the units in a community are rising due to market conditions, as we're seeing the amount of money that's needed for an hourly wage to get a two bedroom or a one bedroom um, rise throughout our state and our nation, it can effectively price out current members of your community, which leads us to the importance of planning for affordability, planning to um, invite people in, but also keep the community members that you have. So the fact that so many of you are here tonight shows that housing affordability is a concern for many throughout the region. Luckily for us, as David said, there are many skilled practitioners who care deeply about this issue and are looking for tools within their respective areas of focus to help increase affordability within our communities. We're very lucky to have two of those practitioners with us here tonight. And so they both are very skilled, so bear with me as I read their or their um, bios because I don't want to mess anything up here. 
So John Kaskowski has been a practicing planner for 20 years. All of the credentials that you see after his name are a testament to his experience in planning, zoning, and sustainability. As the co-founder and principal of Taiki Planning and Policy Group, John serves both private sector developers and municipalities. He's currently the consulting town planner for five municipalities, has served as the economic development coordinator for two, has previously served as the, oops, sorry, and has written numerous planning documents and special studies for over 30 towns and cities in Connecticut. And Jocelyn Ayer has lived and worked in Litchfield County for the last 14 years. Prior to becoming the director of the Litchfield County Center for Housing Opportunity, she served as the Community and Economic Development Director for the Northwest Hills Council of the Governments, where she worked with 21 towns in the region to plan and implement their land use, housing, and economic development initiatives. Over the last two decades, Jocelyn has been involved in all stages of housing development, from planning to construction, financing, and operations. Jocelyn has worked with 16 municipalities over the last two years to develop municipal affordable housing plans as required by CGS 8-30J. The municipalities range in size from the town of Warren to the city of Torrington. And so needless to say, tonight we're hearing from incredibly skilled practitioners who know what it's like to serve communities of all sizes and all types, as you can see from the numbers of places that they have both impacted throughout their careers. And I'm now going to hand it to John to provide us with some land use strategies to advance the work that's been done through your global housing planning. And Savannah, Nicole, while John's getting ready momentarily, I just want to remind our audience, we got a strong audience, a uh, good 60 uh, individuals. On the bottom of your screen, if you have questions, you will see Q&A on the bottom of your screen along the menu of options. Just click it and you can actually type in your question. And then at the end, we'll have an opportunity for Q&A uh, with John and Jocelyn um, or any others. Okay, thank you for that, uh, SN. Um, can folks see my screen? Does it look like a PowerPoint presentation? Okay, good. Um, so this is me. Um, Jocelyn did a lot of the intro. Uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, Savannah Nicole did, did a lot of the intro about uh, who I am, um, but a little bit more specifically about my uh, company, uh, Taiki Planning and Policy Group, which is about two and a half years old um, at this point. Um, my partner Mike and I um, have been involved with uh, municipal planning across the state, um, largely the sort of the eastern two thirds of the state. Um, but I uh, have developed um, since the since the requirement of affordable housing plans um, that SN discussed um, went into went into effect of law back in 2017. We've been very active in writing and helping municipalities do some planning for affordable housing, and so. This is a current map of the affordable housing plans that we've we've led um, throughout the state. So we're at, at about 25 or so um, from from towns as small as Voluntown, which is um, maybe 2,500 people. Actually, Scotland and Hampton are smaller, each about 1,700 people, um, all the way up to the city of Waterbury, um, which is you know at 120,000 give or take. Um, so we've written uh, affordable housing plans for for municipalities of all sizes and. Um, encountered a lot of different sort of approaches um, to affordable housing. But the, the common thing about the affordable housing law um, that uh, SN touched on briefly is that um, the plan just needs to come up with um, action steps or, or uh, ideas of how a municipality will increase the number of affordable housing developments in that municipality. What it does not do, and very specifically does not do, if you know some history of the, of the statute, is it doesn't keep track. It does not hold town's feet to the fire. It does not require any accountability. It does not require any reporting. It does not require any progress. All it requires is a plan. Um, and there is nothing easier than writing a plan, um, despite the fact that uh, we do get paid for it, and it, it's you know sometimes hard work. But... Um, there is nothing harder than implementing a plan. Um, and this is where um, the statute sort of doesn't provide any assistance. Um, and it is up to all of you as um, activists, as, as residents, as committed citizens um, to help your municipality take the next step. Um, and so uh, Asana asked me if I, would, if I would share some of these thoughts with you, particularly from a zoning standpoint. Obviously there's a lot 
of things beyond zoning that can go into an affordable housing plan. It could, you know, include municipal investments, um, you know, it actually building some affordable housing or doing, you know, building some senior housing or providing subsidies. Um, it could, you know, include things like policy uh, where, you know, the town might designate a designated housing official. Um, so there's all kinds of things that a town can do, but a major category is um, zoning. And that's what we're going to talk about today is sort of what are the next steps? How do you actually make your plan happen in your municipality from a zoning standpoint? once the plan has been adopted. Um, so the first um, tip that I, would, that I would suggest is to take a good look at your regulations. And I would start with the goals of the affordable housing plan itself. And again, I know maybe a couple of your municipalities are, are not quite at the finish line yet um, with your affordable housing plan, but um, virtually all of your plans should contain some specific goal some specific action steps that the municipality says that they will undertake in the next five years to try to um, increase, increase the affordable housing supply. And those steps in all likelihood have some sort of nexus or some sort of um, relationship to zoning, whether it's, well, let's take a look at our multifamily zoning regulations, or let's take a look at what we do for accessory dwelling units, or what do we do for mixed use or middle housing. Um, it, there, it probably has some of those elements in it. And more, chances are, it probably has that relatively fuzzy language that the goals probably say something like, consider or study our regulations or give it a good hard think and, and or discuss. Um, and very few plans actually say, we will change these regulations in this direction. But um, it's just still important to take your plan at face value that they do intend to um, strongly consider some of these specific changes. So I would take a look at your existing affordable housing plan and look for those specific zoning elements that they that they wish to address, whether that's multifamily or density or or the permitting process for accessory dwelling units or something like that. And then take a look at the specific sections of your existing zoning regulations, which are usually available on the town website um, for those specific elements. And I'm talking about how does the town uh, permit multifamily? You know, where in town, which in which zoning districts? Uh, what is the process? Is it is it a site plan review? Is it a special permit review? Um, what are the densities? If your town has sewer and water, which I know most of the towns in the valley do, um, what's the minimum density? You know, is are you living in a in an acre zone or a half acre zone, even in areas that are served by public sewer and water? Um, for which there is not a lot of defensible reason why you should have an acre zone in a town with, with sewer lines. Um, but so take a look at some of those elements when you would look at, if I was going to build housing in this neighborhood, in this town, what are the things I would have to know? How does it, how do you treat multifamily? What's the process? What's the density? Do you allow, um, you know, mixed use housing? Could you do apartments over retail or apartments over an office? Could you retrofit an old mill building? And we know the Valley has a lot of those. Could you retrofit one of those as um, housing units? So the, the idea is to take a look and audit your regulations to see what your current condition is. How do your current regulations either promote or, or inhibit um, the development of new housing? So make that list. How does your town treat uh, development right now? And then the next step would be to adjust those things is to fix those elements um, sort of one by one uh, that that inhibit. So if you are in um, and if your your regulations don't allow multifamily at all in certain residential zones, flag that. Um, say this is something that we want to adjust. Or if the multifamily regulations are only a, a costly and and complicated special permit process with lots of public hearings and lots of costly traffic studies and, and things like that. Take, take note of that um, and, and take note of things like large lot zoning to, you know, uh, some of you are in, in relatively um, suburban communities, one acre, two acre, or even larger. Um, take a look at how much land you need to set aside for any given housing unit. And so basically look at all of each of those things and kind of make a, make a priority list because, you know, we're not going to solve um, affordable housing all in one year. We're not going to solve affordable housing all in, in 
five years, the first five years of these plans. So it's important to sort of make a priority list and 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 start, you know, one thing at a time. Um, take take basically bite-sized pieces um, and make your priority list of what needs to get changed first. And while you do that, um, don't think that you have to reinvent the wheel. Um, the thing about these affordable housing plans is every town has to have one <laughs> and every town is, is struggling through the same process. Um, and, you know, very often when I, when I give presentations about affordable housing plans, um, you know, towns ask me, well, who's, who's doing it best? Which town should we look to? Um, and the answer is, well, no, no town is doing it best. And no one in Connecticut, particularly in Connecticut has sort of figured out how to fix affordable housing or how to provide sufficient housing and a range of a range of prices and a range of um, styles for everybody um, so we're all we're all working on different aspects of it and you know we'll say things like you know Jocelyn and Salisbury have set up a really good you know community um, process for a, for a, a housing committee but you know there's still a lot of need in Salisbury with, with all due respect to the work that they've done there you know the need just exists um, and so nobody's nobody's solved it but what we can do is lean on other municipalities in different aspects. You could, um, looking at other towns, um, even, even in other regions, of the, either other regions of the country, for examples of what's a really good accessory dwelling unit regulation, or what's a really good um, set of standards for uh, putting middle housing, which is basically you know, sort of two to eight unit housing, in existing neighborhoods by maybe retrofitting an old historic building or an old like a big McMansion that's you know 5,000 square feet and nobody's you know there's two people are living there um so are there are there specific examples for the zoning that you have identified as your priority so look around for those um examples that could be slotted into your your town's regulations and you don't have to do that on your own um there are resources out there and I would definitely work with municipal staff on, on answering your questions about, you know, am I right in reading this map that this area is, you know, old single family only two acre zoning? Is that right? Is there, is there any opportunity for multifamily? Is there any opportunity for increased density? Um, and also ask them about other examples or ask them where to look. Um, because if there's one thing that, that local planning and zoning people love to do, it is copy other towns regulations. And and you know not have to reinvent things for themselves. So tap into that those networks of other communities that are sort of struggling along with you, or that have maybe figured something out that works in terms of increasing density or retrofitting existing structures or reuse of historic mill facilities. Um, these are all things that that you know you don't need to write from scratch. You can use examples from other communities. And then when you're ready, and again, I, I would recommend, you know, taking taking bite-sized pieces and 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 starting with, you know, the the proverbial low-hanging fruit or or maybe some of the most obvious, most needed changes, like like um, in, introducing multifamily regulations in the first place, or fixing your accessory dwelling units, or changing your densities in certain areas. Um, so start with those, you know, um, you know, start with one or two things, and then work your way through the process um and and this is you know probably necessary because again as municipalities and particularly a number of the ones that i that i've worked with um are very very enthusiastic about coming up with and adopting um affordable housing plans largely because they are you know they they are feel good for the most part. They really don't hold town's feet to the fire in terms of actually having to produce anything. Um, and and they, you know, hey, everyone, we, we came up with a plan. We, we were doing something proactive. But when, when the plan is actually adopted and municipalities are actually asked, particularly planning and zoning commissions, are actually asked to implement the things that they adopted in their, in their plans, it gets a lot harder. Um, it gets a lot harder to to tell towns that they actually have to do something, and left to their own devices, um, towns will drag their feet um, in many many cases. And and there's a couple of towns, small towns out in in eastern Connecticut that I work with, 
that were very enthusiastic about adopting their affordable housing plans that included stuff like making um, multifamily easier and making older home retrofits easier. Um, and it has been a year and a half in one of these towns of meeting month after month after month after month and giving them versions of multifamily regulations that they're just very unhappy with and very dissatisfied with. And, oh, could we change this? And, oh, I don't really know what that's going to look like for the town. The, the thing with a municipality, if they are the lead actor, if your planning and zoning commission is the one proposing and considering zoning changes, they have zero timeline. They can take as long as they want um, to make a change. But if they get an application from an outside entity, for instance, uh, one of your all-in groups or, or um, a, a citizen's organization or a, a private developer or a private property owner, they have to consider and act um, in, in a certain amount of uh, months. Um, so they, they are forced to act. And, and so um, having outside groups hold a planning and zoning commission's feet to the fire and putting them on a time clock is often very, very useful, but it's very important that you do the process correctly. Make sure you understand the application procedures, the timelines, the fees, um, you know, that perhaps can be waived if you're a nonprofit group or you're doing this, you know, you could ask for that. Um, and, and certainly ask for help again from your local planning and zoning staff um, or someone like SN who is, who is a regional resource um, to help put together the application um, for these specific changes. And again, not all the changes at once, but you know, one or two at a time. And a couple, while you're preparing the application, a couple of the um, things to focus on in your narrative, because a, a text amendment basically requires, you know, the specific nuts and bolts. We're changing section 23.2.B, you know, to move multifamily from a special permit to a site plan. You know, so you, the, those multi, the, the um, nuts and bolts changes. And then you need a narrative, a why. A why are you proposing this change? And why is it in the town's best interest? And why should the change be made? There are a couple of things that you absolutely should focus on. Number one is the affordable housing plan, is chances are that that municipality said, we will do something to make multifamily easier, or we will do something to make accessory dwelling units easier. And so you are basically going in and saying, you said you would do this, here you go, do it. Um, and then the second thing you really ought to, to, to um, call on is the plan of conservation and development, which is a Townwide plan that's produced every 10 years by the planning commission or the planning and zoning commission for commissions that are joint. And that states the ways that the town will um, make policy changes over the next 10 years. Um, and any amendment to the zoning regulations needs to be in harmony with that master plan. Um, the commission really shouldn't adopt changes that are that are contrary. Um, to the master plan. But fortunately, most master plans, most plans of conservation and development are very, uh, are fairly progressive, I, I would say, and, and do say things like the town will um, do what it can to be more uh, amenable and be, be uh, more permissive of affordable housing or make um, affordable housing or housing opportunities widely available in that municipality. So find that language in the plan of conservation and development. And in making your case, point back to the town's master plan and said, you said you would do this. You said that you would make for a better housing environment in your community. This is your opportunity to do so. And that needs to be part of the case that you make. John, quick question while you're on Absolutely. that. We yeah. had a question from the audience. Which plan takes precedence in a town, the affordable housing plan or the plan of conservation and development? And what could be done if they're at odds? Um, the the plan of conservation and development statutorily is the only one that matters. Um, as of right now, the um, affordable housing plan um, does not have the weight of, of um, the, the statutory weight that the, the plan of conservation and development has. Um, there was a small section of the statute that allows municipalities to incorporate their affordable housing plan as a part of the plan of conservation and development. Municipalities don't have to. Um, if they do, that's very useful because then the affordable housing plan has sort of that, that, that additional weight. But um, the statute basically says if you're going to make a text change, it needs to be in harmony with the plan of conservation and development. So um, it's, it's good to have something in the affordable housing plan and it builds your case, but it 
you really need to point specifically to the, the plan of conservation and development in, in um, convincing them about uh, uh, you know, the, the wisdom of the change. Um, and then it comes to actually making the case. So in a, with, a, with a text amendment, which is what you'd be proposing, that requires uh, a public hearing. And the public hearing is an opportunity for advocates and opponents and neutral parties to have their piece, to speak their piece. Um, and so it's really important to get your supporters, to get, get um, people to testify and tell different parts of the story. Um, and in, in preparing this, you know, certainly you wanna rally, rally your support amongst your core folks, but also um, different, different elements. And it's, it's worth um, a little bit of organization, a little bit of stagecraft, a little bit of choreography, if you will, to make sure that that different people are telling different ends of the of the story, and again, in this case, um, talk to your resources, talk to your town planners, talk to your zoning officers, talk to regional housing advocates like Jocelyn, like uh, regional resources like SN. Um, and it's important to tell multiple stories. You know, it's certainly holding them to their own words to the things that the town adopted as policy in the POCD in the affordable housing plan is really important because you're echoing their words back to them and giving them an opportunity to make good essentially on their promises. But it's also important to, to, to tell a variety of stories for, for, from, from social justice standpoint where, um, and, and even from the, the, common, the common man perspective, your, your everyday um, neighbors, and as, as David talked about, you know, your, your physician's assistants and your um, bus drivers and your school teachers and your retail clerks. Um, these are the people that need affordable housing and getting folks from all walks of that life is is really important. But then also from elements like property rights, um, you know, that that uh, in most cases, the zoning proposals that we'd be suggesting allow people to do more with their property and uh, allow them to um, see more economic value from their property, which which appeals to a very different category of people. And you know, so all of a sudden, I don't need to just have a single family residence. I can also have an accessory apartment above my garage where I can get rental income, or I could convert my old my old house into four apartment units and get rental income that way and provide housing opportunities. Those are things that that unlock people's property potential um, and has appeal that way. And then it's also important to anticipate and preempt the objections. You know, there's a lot of reasons why these changes haven't been made in the past. And a lot of those are irrational fears, frankly, about the types of people you might encourage in town or the types of effect that, that multifamily housing or, or less, um, less costly housing might have on the community's character. So, so anticipate those. And there's a, a, a mountain of great documentation and, and anecdotal stories from not only in Connecticut, but around the country about how um, broader housing opportunities really enhanced communities and, and did not create the sort of, you know, exploding school system Armageddon or, or crime waves that, that people are quick to jump to. So sort of anticipating these things and have people telling stories about, you know, I moved into a town in an affordable housing, um, you know, situation and became an incredibly valuable member of the community and, and you know, that, that adding to, the, to the, um, the fabric of the community. These are the stories that we want to tell that directly anticipate and respond to um, the objections. So those are three. And the last thing I would um, suggest is I give you a little bonus strategy is tell the story and get the word out, um, particularly as you are building your case, particularly as you are uh, letting people know about these things, um, and, and particularly after after communities um, adopt these changes, so many towns over the last year or so changed their regulations to allow for um, accessory dwelling units or you know in law apartments that you know you don't have to rent to in laws, but um, that you could do an apartment above the garage or you could do a cottage in the backyard. I would say, you know, scores if not over a hundred communities changed the way they dealt with accessory dwelling units over the last year and a half. And almost nobody knows. Um, I would say 95% of residents who this, these changes affected 
have no idea that all of a sudden they are allowed to have an accessory unit on their property. And that's ridiculous, you know? Um, so spreading the word, letting realtors know, letting builders know, letting, letting your people in your community know through newsletters, social media, websites. And, and this, this applies not only to changes that have already been made, but the, the types of changes you're proposing and why you're proposing them is get the word out because the more people know about this, um, the, 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 bigger, the more pressure that can be brought to bear on um, the community leaders um, who have in their affordable housing plans and POCDs pledged to make things better and it's time for them to do it. So that's my song and dance. Um, we can save questions for the end or if you wanna deal with that now, Asana, it's up to you. Yeah, we'll save questions at the end so we can get to Jocelyn's. But thank you so much for your strategies. And I love the bonus one too. So I. And to love John's it. point, while well, Jocelyn's getting ready, a couple of exemplars all in for Milford with accessory dwelling units. I highly encourage you to reach out to Jen and the all in for Milford leadership group. Um, to John's point, have really moved the needle on that, as has all in for Seymour. You can reach out to Jenny and many other leaders um, who. who um, our proof point on the 80, the accessory dwelling unit issue that John just spoke about. All right, I'll just jump in if that's okay. I'm very excited to be here with you guys. Um, you know, what, what Team Inc. does every day is so inspiring. And, you know, the, this, the all in movement is just so exciting. So um, I think it's great uh, that you all are here tonight and engaging in this. Um, so um, again, just very briefly, um, Jocelyn from the Center for Housing Opportunity for Litchfield County. Um, there is also a Fairfield County Center and now an Eastern Connecticut um, Center that's relatively new. But really what we're trying to do is coordinate a regional response to um, housing affordability challenges, and we do that by really trying to bring together a bunch of um, cross-sector um, organizations and partners. What I'm gonna be talking about tonight is the involvement of town housing um, commissions and housing plan implementation committees. So we're working with a bunch of those here in Litchfield County. We also work with the local housing nonprofits, um, the Economic Development Corporation, anchor institutions, and then folks like the Department of Housing, LISC, RPA, um, and local community foundations that can all be really helpful in um, supporting these efforts um, and, and uh, really making progress, turning those plans into action. Um, so we already talked about what plans I've been involved with um, helping, uh, like John, communities really of all um, sizes and shapes. And, um, you know, I agree with John that, um, you know, if you wanna get some ideas maybe of, of what your town could do um, that isn't already in your plan, you know, you should be able to find other towns, um, housing plans on their websites as well. And you could look for ideas um, in, in those. Um, I'm going to talk very briefly actually about the community that I live in, um, Salisbury, Connecticut, um, and some example here of how we have a town um, affordable housing commission that really supports the local nonprofits in our town in a meaningful way and helps implement the town's affordable housing plan. Um, so again, just by way of kind of a case study, and I'll share some other examples with you of some other towns in Connecticut that are also doing this in a slightly different way. Um, so the town of Salisbury's Affordable Housing Commission um, was uh, did help create the town's affordable housing plan. It was actually adopted back in 2018. And I have to argue with John because I think it's the best plan in the state. Um, and I'll tell you why. I think it's the best plan in the state, and I haven't read them all, but um, because it specifically um, it specifically names places where housing can go, uh, specific sites and specific numbers of units that can go on those sites, and um, a lot of it is town-owned land. And I know not every town has town-owned land necessarily, but I think. Um, 
a lot of them do. <laughs> Um, and also really looking at um, options for expanding the existing affordable housing developments. Um, you know, that's another kind of potentially low hanging fruit. Um, but again, I think it's great if plans, if the affordable housing plans do mention specific um, properties or that, you know, would be available for development. If they don't, there's still ways of getting there. Um, but um, but I digress a little. <laughs> so the, the Salisbury Affordable Housing Commission did help create Salisbury's housing plan um, and has been working over the last five years to implement the strategies in the plan. I do think it's pretty critical to have some entity within your town that is focused on it and they don't have to meet every month. Um, it could be quarterly, um, but um, I think having, you know, if if, if your town is serious or you are serious uh, in, in helping your town implement your plan, you really do need um, to have an entity of some kind that is focused on that, um, like any like anything else. Um, the other thing our town does have is an, a, a housing fund, and I'll talk about that in a minute because it is another piece that can be really helpful in supporting the local housing organizations. So here in Salisbury, again, we have this town commission that is appointed by the Board of Selectmen. And that um, really supports the two private nonprofit organizations that we have in our town that actually build, own, and manage the affordable housing that's created. So we have the housing trust that does affordable homeownership we have the housing committee that does affordable rental. Um, and some towns just have one nonprofit that do both. That's great too. Um, but in our town, we have two separate nonprofit entities that do that. Um, we also have one website that houses all of those organizations under one site so that people can find all that information in one place. Um, that's why you see that this is actually a screenshot of the Salisbury, um, town of Salisbury's um, website for their, their affordable housing groups. Um, as I mentioned, again, the, the commission um, was established by the Board of Selectmen. The members are appointed by the Board of Selectmen um, and they hold public forums, they update, you know, the housing plan data um, as needed, they solicit feedback from the community, they really help, um, you know, if there's a specific development coming up, um, you know, help get people to come to the public meetings about those. Uh, they produce and maintain um, the housing plan and they're actually right now doing an update of it. Um, and then through the housing um, tr trust fund that was created through a town ordinance, um, they can also help support the local housing nonprofits in building the housing. Um, so back in 2010, the town of Salisbury created this affordable housing fund. Um, <clears throat> they typically put it in the town budget for around $25,000 uh, a year. That is generous, I will say. I talk to a lot of towns <laughs> um, and some towns don't have the appetite for it. But I think, again, if your municipality is interested in really supporting the next steps for creating housing options, um, that it's important not to create, not to just create a, you know, town housing commission or housing plan implementation committee, but also to empower them with some resources. And this is one way to do that. Um, so in our town, um, for example, the private nonprofits that are creating these housing options can apply to this fund to help them with pre-development costs, or you know, maybe they have to dig a test pit to see if a site is feasible for development. Um, or, you know, sometimes they, uh, you know, they need to help rehab a, a home or something. Um, this can help pay for that. Um, a few other examples, just to give you, um, the town of Washington has also has a housing commission that predates its housing plan and was very much involved in creating its um, housing plan. Um, they also have a town housing fund in Washington. And one of the things they do with it is um, provide um, down payment assistance for income eligible home buyers. 
to buy homes in the town. Um, and they also support their private nonprofit, which is the Washington Community Housing Trust there um, with that housing fund, which again has been critical to helping take the next steps um, when an opportunity uh, presents itself to develop a site or even see if a site is developable. Um, in Cornwall, they took the approach of having a housing plan implementation committee. So again, very focused on implementing the housing plan and really bringing together a group that can help implement it. So you'll probably see in your plan, um, hopefully you've got a list of strategies in your plan. They're tasked usually to some entity like planning and zoning, board of selectmen, town council. Um, and so um, you would wanna have representatives from those groups that really should be you know, implementing those specific strategies in your implementation committee or implementation group. Um, New Milford has a housing partnership. New Fairfield has a housing opportunities committee, which is again, a committee that is working on creating their housing plan. Um, and this, this here is just kind of pulled actually from the town of Litchfield's housing plan, um, which is really, again, how are we gonna implement our plan? We've got one now, we have five years before we have to do an update and we wanna make some progress. Um, I think having an implementation committee, as I mentioned, is really critical. Um, you know, this kind of mentions some of the um, representatives that they wanted on their implementation committee. Um, I think committing yourself to an annual summary of progress that will be, you know, reported to the board of selectmen or the town meeting. Um, some of our towns have done that and it's been really successful. Again, it just keeps you accountable. Um, for doing something with your plan. Um, as John mentioned, um, it's great if this housing plan becomes part of your uh, town plan of conservation development, it gives it more weight. Um, that's not, doesn't work in every community, but um, if it does, you know, kind of pushing to have this be part or at least consistent with your town's plan of conservation development is helpful. Um, and um, so those are a couple. Um, oh, I wanted to talk just quickly about, you know, who you might want to have on the committee. Um, I guess I'll underscore something that I heard Jenny say at the beginning, which is that um, you don't have to be an expert on housing or housing affordability to be on a committee like this. Um, you just have to have, be interested in it and, you know, a little, again, passion for the topic, um, you know, or per, again, personal experience um, being housing insecure, um, you know, all of those things are really great. Um, so some of the other folks that we often want to see on the committee, but again, it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be a group of, of people that care and that want to make change. Um, but um, if you have a rep from the Planning and Zoning Commission, the Board of Selectmen or Town Council, you know, again, sometimes a realtor or builder is really good to have on it. Um, a representative actually, actually from the Town Conservation Commission or Land Trust. There is no um, conflict between conservation and affordable housing. We need both in all of our communities. Um, so I think bringing them into the conversation is a good thing, faith-based communities. Um, but again, I would say don't let the, what's the phrase, the perfect get in the way of the good. <laughs> um, you can, you, you know, just getting some folks on that um, care about this um, is, is the most important thing and having a committee who's focused on this. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to leave you here with a couple short videos that we have on our website in case they're helpful to you. Um, this one, Housing Our Neighbors, and one of our local community groups did it. And it really tells the story of people in our communities that need housing options like this. Um, and I think that's really powerful. Um, you know, if you can do something like that in your community, if people are willing to tell their stories, um, like John said, it's a great thing to have to motivate folks um, to action. Um, but again, just to make more awareness that this is something that people in our communities are struggling with. It's not something about, you know, people from far away or in some other town. Um, it's our it's our neighbors. Um, and um, 
Then this other one, um, an investment in our community, which is also on our website and it is about 10 minutes long. And it does, um, it shows you pictures of what affordable housing looks like in Litchfield County, um, how attractive it can be, and then answer some like frequently asked questions about how, um, you know, how it got there and interviews the, the, the town housing committees and town nonprofits and volunteers that made it happen. Cause this is all volunteer driven in Litchfield County. Um, so I just wanted to leave you with those in case they help you kind of, you know, show your community what, what housing can look like, what, how volunteers can be impactful in creating those opportunities and, you know, really like stories of people in your town, your community um, that, that need this. Um, so with that, I will stop sharing. Thank you so much, Jocelyn. So we have one more question from the audience that we'll go over really quickly. Um, would love any advice on how to move forward when a town has no interest in creating any affordable housing? And I think that that's a really great question for you. And, and John, if you have anything also to add, it'd be greatly appreciated. So I'll just say, um, you know, I think you know, I mentioned that in Litchfield County, a lot of this is volunteer driven. It's all volunteer housing nonprofits. And it just starts with, again, a group of passionate people um, who really want to address this, creating an organization that does it. It doesn't have to be linked to the town. So if the town isn't serious, that's, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, <laughs> you know, um, if there's a group of, of residents who are who care about this, you can create your own organization and and find opportunities. Um, and you know, again, I'd be I'd be happy to um, answer more questions about that. But um, in in Litchfield County, it's really it's been critical. Most of our communities now have a local housing nonprofit organization that is separate from the town. Obviously it's ideal if you can work together, but um, if you can't, <laughs> you can still, you can still make progress, um, you know, uh, if you, you create your own private nonprofit entity. Awesome. I, I, I would also add that there's, there's sometimes value and shame um, in, in, uh, and I think in part, particularly with commissions that talk big in their in their plans and their affordable housing plans and their POCDs, but but show a significant reluctance to actually move forward on stuff. Because um, generally speaking, there aren't these groups in town like like All In um, or Team that that actually forward you know try to make forward progress and try to get the commissions to do the good things that they promised they would do. Um, and, and, you know, submitting these applications and saying, listen, you all said you would do this. You have not only a, you know, a moral and ethical responsibility to your, you know, your fellow man and, you know, your fellow residents, but also you promised, you wrote a plan, you adopted a plan. Um, so do it. And there, there's value in shaming. All right, we have one more question that will make our final question and then I'm going to hand it over to Lily McKenzie of team to, to wrap us up. And I think this is a good one for both of you as well. What is a reasonable time expectation in terms of what would be considered solid progress? Is the metric the percentage of affordable housing available or is there another metric you think should be gone by or in addition to? John, you're gonna let me. <laughs> I think that's hard. I mean, uh, um, what one thing I tried to do in the plans that I worked on um, is encourage the communities to have some kind of measurable goals, um, but also realistic goals. Um, and so, obviously, if you're if you have a measurable goal in your plan, like. 30 new affordable housing units in the next five years, um, then you can measure progress in five years. I mean, housing development does take a long time. Um, and I think you want to celebrate little wins along the way too. Like if you 
implement a strategy in your plan to just get the word out about Chaffa mortgages um, or, um, you know, assistance with heating costs or things like that. I think hopefully your plan has a range of strategies that are sort of short term and longer term, um, because I think it's a good question. It takes a long time to actually create units. Um, but um, I think if you can implement several of the actions in your housing plan um, that you're making, you're making progress. And, and I think that's, that's, that's an excellent point. And, and, you know, again, there's, because this is the first sort of set of affordable housing plans that a lot of people are sort of overreacting and, and you know, towns that are only at, you know, 2% of their housing stock affordable, you know, saying, oh, how the heck are we going to get to 10% um, or whatever the goal is, you know, it's, it's not going to happen quickly. And, and housing development, particularly if that's, you know, the focus does, as Jocelyn said, take a lot of time. So doing some doing some uh, expectation setting and, and management of expectations, not only for the advocates, but also for the commissions and the, and the town officials that this is, you know, the first steps in what's going to be a very long process. Um, and, and don't, you know, tell people that, you know, that things are going to be fixed overnight, or that your town is going to be transformed overnight. Um, these are these are gradual things, and 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 we've got to all work together over a long over a long road. Awesome. Um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap us up with a couple of uh, quick comments. Um, if you are on this webinar and you're looking for information on your personal housing situation, if you're having trouble um, finding housing that you can afford or keeping that roof over your head, um, team is here to help. We have casework staff who are dedicated to working one-on-one -on -one with you, um, understanding um, your situation and trying to help you out with the, the resources and tools that we have. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and put in teams um, email one more time for anybody here who would like to reach out and contact our staff again for um, your personal um, situation. We are always here um, to help you. Um, and if you would like to get involved um, in the advocacy part of changing the conditions in our, our towns um, and the supply of affordable housing, again, you've heard so much about the all-in movement tonight, and we have just some leaders of uh, a growing movement that's over 60 leaders strong in our community. So you'll see these faces, um, Jenny, Eric, Stephanie, um, Jen, Bob. Jackie, these are leaders representing their all in chapters and uh, they would be happy to talk with you about what they've been up to, um, what they've been working on. They're constantly convening conversations and um, bringing together our community to have these important conversations and um, move our towns forward together. Um, you know, our towns are making decisions for us. They should have our voices um, heard as they're making decisions. So. I wanted to go ahead and share um, another resource that we have at team. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. This is the um, dedicated housing page that David was referencing before. So you're going to find all sorts of good information on here. This is constantly updated. Um, so check it out every so often. So first on the top, you'll see um, some of the all-in chapters and links to their respective websites. So if you're interested um, in learning more, check them out there. Um, additionally, on the right-hand side here, you'll see some data um, that we've gathered, and you could check out um, some data specific to our region um, here in team that we serve the Lower Naugatuck Valley and surrounding towns. Um, very illuminating data, um, you know, based on the conditions that we're seeing right now. We've also got some great videos, um, David Morgan speaking um, with some other housing experts at the Envision panel hosted by Envy Cog last fall. Um, we've got Stephanie who's here on, on screen today. Um, Sarah and Stephanie are leaders from All In for Oxford and All In for Ansonian Derby who shared their stories with um, uh, uh, the Valley Council on Health and Human Services and what All In means for them. Um, so you'll learn, you'll get some good insights about what All In does and, and what it means um, for our communities. And of course, uh, we had a, a beautiful convening again last fall 
um, talking about housing and the late great Q Williams um, gave a very inspiring speech um, about just tenacity and sticking with it, um, hearing you know what people are saying and, and the different perspectives and still pushing forward. Um, so I would definitely watch his video if you get uh, a couple of minutes. Um, as well as Commissioner Salem Mascara Bruno of the Connecticut Department of Housing um, offered some great insights into what the State Department of Housing is working on. So these are, again, some, some very valuable um, videos if you have the time. Keeping news articles on here, as well as um, those affordable housing plans, once they're published, we'll have um, all of them up here, as well as links to the affordable housing commissions um, as they start getting created and moving forward with their work. Um, so again, check that out, teaminc.org slash housing dash forum. Um, constantly will be updated. Um, let's see, I'm going to uh, just check in on touching base on a survey. So after this webinar, um, we will be sending out a short survey to our attendees. Um, this is our first in a series. Um, so we're looking for your feedback on how we can make these better. Um, so it'll be a short um, couple of questions that we will send out and your feedback would be very much appreciated. Um, I'm going to go ahead and launch our poll for tonight. Um, Again, this is the first in a series, and we are ready to um, start planning another workshop so we can continue to educate um, the residents and city leaders making the decisions. And so we'd like your feedback on what you would like to see next. So I'm going to go ahead and launch our poll. Um, and this question is asking, what topic are you most interested in seeing as team's next housing workshop in this series? please go ahead and make one selection. Um, so we've got five options. Um, are you interested in learning more about increasing home ownership and opportunities in your community? Um, would you like to, to touch on tenant landlord relationships, including absenteeism? Um, affordable housing myth busters. Um, so this is a fun one. <laughs> we'll talk a little bit about um, bringing affordable housing into our communities. What does that mean for education costs, property values? crime, traffic, what's the real story here? Um, and what does affordable housing actually look like? Um, another option is economic development and opportunity, um, competing municipalities and housing. Um, how can this help move uh, the, the economy forward in our towns? And health-related social needs, housing and public health, the connections there. Um, so take another couple of seconds, get your votes in. And based on your feedback, um, we will start planning our next housing workshop, which will be held on September 12th at 6 p.m. Go ahead and mark your calendars. Got some great participation here. I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and share results. All right, looks like Mythbusters it is. Thank you guys for your feedback. We will start planning that for you and we will see you back on September 12th. Um, and then uh, just one more um, time, the all in emails will be in the chat box. Please reach out. There we go. Um, and if you need any sort of um, training attendance certificate, we can provide that. Again, email info to at teaminc.org um, if you need proof for any sort of continuing education requirement. And with that, we will go ahead and end the evening. Thank you so much for sticking with us. And we will see you back for uh, the next in the series. And this will also this recording will also be available on our website. So thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you, John. Thank you, Jocelyn. Thank you so much.